Uh, first of all, thank you, ma'am, for this humble uh, introduction. And standing before the stalwarts, ma'am, piercing ma'am, Jyoti ma'am, ma it's like um, Suraj ko diya dikhana or something like that. I feel humbled as well, a bit scared also standing in front of my teachers and Jyoti ma'am. Ma and uh, then, first of all, I would like to thank uh, Mohawk Hospital and AIB for giving me this opportunity to come to you and uh, present a topic. Um, initially, when I was making my talk, I was uh, very much about molecular techniques and uh, the newer diagnostic tests that we are doing. But then I thought that let's go to the basics first. Let's understand the basic tests that we are using in cancer diagnosis because very frequently we get uh, FNACs and the diagnosis of breast tumors or FNACs, saying things like ductal carcinoma and what, which I would like to say, uh, you have to, uh, FNAC is more of a speeding test. And uh, so I thought I'll just find out the nuances of the different tests that we use in cancer diagnosis, because now every day we hear a new test, a new marker. So let's uh, find out that, uh, what are these tests and what exact information they give us. So I've kept my uh, lecture very basic. And um, I don't know if Dr. Swapdil is here or not. He was saying, please talk about um, TNBCs and all. But sorry, Swapdil, I could reach up to there because I was caught in the basics only so much. So that may be the next talk we can talk. Right. So uh, understanding the tests which you use in cancer diagnosis. Let me begin that before the test, the most important thing is clinical evaluation. The clinical and the radiological details are invaluable for an optimal pathological diagnosis. For example, radiation induced changes. If you see under the microscope, whenever there are radiation induced changes, they look very much like a cancer. So, if you don't have a history that the patient has been given radiation, it will be impossible to differentiate whether it is a malignancy or it is just a benign lesion. Similarly, you know, differentiating a benign from a malignant tumor. If there's a long history, more than six months of a lump in the breast, definitely we think of a benign lesion. But supposing we get to know the history, a rapidly increasing lump, maybe with a history of 15 to 20 days, immediately we start thinking, yes, this could be more in favor of medical tissue. So whatever said and done, there may be an array of tests which are available now, but we begin with a simple detailed history and neurological details, as we very much uh, well know. Now we have uh, mammography in breast cancer, and we have the virus rating, which uh, tells you the different uh, virus scores, and which tell you from category one to category five, whether a lesion is favoring a benign lesion or a benign lesion. Then the second and the most important point, the specimen must be adequate. It should be representative and properly preserved. Because very frequency, frequently we are seeing biopsies and then there's no tumor tissue and that constant, uh, I think uh, that the constant, uh, I think the Mahabharat between the clinician and the pathologist that we are given the simple diagnosis in, uh, insufficient for evaluation and the clinicians are like, the pathologists don't do their uh, diagnosis. So but then we tell you very frequently we do not see the whole morphology to diagnose a test and then we have to give something like insufficient for diagnosis or a very small tissue bit. Right. So let's start with one of the tests. And I think we are familiar with all these tests. The cytopathological examination, the histopathological examination, and then we now have newer techniques. We have flow cytometry. We have molecular techniques like PCR, FISH, NGS. And this, an easily available test is tumor markers. These methods play a crucial role in accurately diagnosing cancer and they provide important insights into tumor characteristics and management. Coming to the first test, that is the cytopathological examination. Now, what is cytopathological examination? Here, we study the cells to diagnose a cancer, right? So there's a basic difference between cytology and histopathology. In histopathology, we get the whole tissue. So if we see the architecture of that tissue, whereas in cytology, we are just looking at cells. 
Again, it can be of two types. It can be exfoliative and it can be inter interventional. Exfoliative is when spontaneously the, the shedding of cells from the lining of an organ into the body cavity, like our pleural, all the fluids, ascitic fluid, pleural fluids, and the very simple example is the pap smear, which is used to detect cervical lesions. So we are today focusing on breast and uh, gynecology lesions. So I'll talk a little in detail about the pap smear. Then next is intervention cytology. Intervention cytology means that we actively connect cells through a procedure which is known as fine needle aspiration cytology. Right? So as I said, cytopathological examination helps us identify abnormal cells. And then we determine if they are cancerous or not. Hence, they age in the diagnosis and subsequent management of cancer, but sometimes they might not be the only test on the basis of which we will diagnose a cancer. And when we talk about breast cancers, let me tell you, now it is um, recommended that instead of a FNAC, go for a core biopsy. The advantages being, first of all, in the core biopsy, you can, in any cancer, what differentiates a benign from a malignant lesion is invasion, right? So invasion is one thing which we definitely diagnose on the basis of a tissue, because then you can see that the cells, they are invading the stroma. Whereas in cytology, you're seeing only the cells. You look at the cells and their features like increased NC ratio, hyperchromasia, that's what helps you diagnose a case of uh, malignancy. So in breast, what happens is now we know that as important as the diagnosis of histological diagnosis, equally important is our ER, PR, and HER2 due to status. So to do ER, PR, and HER2, we'll definitely need a tissue. And tissue can be had by a core biopsy and not by FNAC, right? And further, now we are going for molecular tests. So definitely now we are discouraging FNACs and we're going for core biopsies. There are multiple other reasons also, which we can discuss later. Next, coming to cervical cancer diagnosis, as I was talking about the past year, we know that there are various screening techniques for cervical cytology, starting right from the uh, historical test, the PAP test, which was discovered by Patnari Gallo, then the visual examination of cervix, then now we have HPV DNA testing, and all these combined together, and we have the updated Bethesda system for reporting of cervical, cervical vaginal spheres. Again, the Bethesda tells us the different categories, whether a tissue is completely negative for malignancy or it is a it is positive for malignancy or it is suspicious. Again, so it is more like again a screening test. It is not the definitive test on which we should base our further treatment. It is mainly a screening test, right? Then other changes have over have occurred over the years, and now we have increased use of one of the techniques which I think most of my gynecologist friends are now practicing now is called liquid-based cytology. And yes, we also now go for high-risk HPV testing. And we have something called core testing where PAP and high-risk HPV is done. And I think there are different recommendations. And we have the recommendations of NCCN also. And we have the, uh, I think the gynecological society also, they have the recommendations of when to do which test and what is the management of that. I won't go into the details of that just now. So as we look, screening for cervical cancer, cancers, which test to be done? As we all know, that test has got a low sensitivity but a high specificity, meaning if we see a malignant cell, then definitely it is in favor of a malignant lesion. But even if we do not see a malignant cell, it may have malignancy otherwise. Then we have other methods like visual detection methods, and these can be valuable alternative to path stain for cervical cancer screening in low resource setting. So still we can use these tests in combination in, if we have a low resource setting, because even these tests have water sensitivity and specificity ranging from 70 to 90%. So here I will talk about what we now have the NBC, which is also known as thin prep, and there are two techniques here. We have the thin prep and the short sure path. If we compare the conventional pap smear and the thin prep test, what exactly is the difference between the two? What is happening in the pap smear? We are taking, uh, connecting the pap smear with the spatula, we are spreading over a slide, and then you're playing and see this. Here, what is happening? This thing is being done in a machine. So, what are the advantages here? If you see, the background here is much cleaner. And the main problem we pathologists get in evaluating a pap smear is 
obscuration, if there is excessive mucus, very frequently the patients of CS cervix, they have bleeding, right? And there's lots of inflammation. So all these factors, usually what they give us a very dirty background and gives very difficult to evaluate a cell, the features of a cell. As I told you, cytology is basically cells. So it's difficult to evaluate a cell if we get a very dirty pattern. So if we see here, in the, the other uh, thing is, spatula we are spreading over the slide. Lots of cells are still remaining on the spatula, right? Whereas in the thin web test, what we do is, I'll just show you. We collect the sample with a brush and then we wash it in a solution. And this solution is transferred to a machine and this machine makes slides for us. So what is happening? All the sample which is being collected is getting transferred and needing slides over this. So if we compare it to here, majority of the cells are left behind what capture. Here, virtually all of the sample is collected. Here, there can be a non-resident transfer. As I said, something sticking on the wooden spatula, we might miss a malignant cell. And there will be, as I said, there is lots of clumping and overlapping because this is a mechanical process. With the hand, we are spreading. Whereas here, the same process is being done by a filter or by a sediment sedimentation method. Okay, so it is like a machine which is doing the work and here the human is doing the work. So, again, okay, as I said, obscuring material uh, get, makes it very difficult for a pathologist to look at the cells. So, the thin web technique has advantages over these. It's a machine where all the cells are connected. There is a almost 100% transfer of the cells which have been collected in the past year. There is even distribution and there is minimal obscuring of data. So definitely this step is superior. But yes, remember, it has got disadvantages also. Number one, it is, is it cost effective? Especially when we are going for screening for the masses. So we have to ask us the question, ask the question is it a very, uh, is it a cost effective test? Then also many times the background also helps us, right? Because we as pathologists, many times there may be something in the background, there's something for necrosis. If there's necrosis in the background, that tells us necrosis is a feature of high-grade tumor cells. So if there's necrosis in the background, it tells us that we're looking at something malignant and we look for more cells. But here, the background is absolutely clear. We don't see necrosis. Another thing, mucus. You know, mucus may be bad, but there's something called mucin. Mucin, again, might give you a hint that we might be looking at a mucin-secreting adenocarcinoma, which will be present in a conventional sphere, but which will be upset in a thin, uh, thin red pap test. But uh, as I tell you, every test has got their advantages as well as limitations. And we have to measure the uh, circumstances we are working, what exactly we want, and that helps us in driving a correct test for the analysis. So this is uh, the LBC technique. We have the thin bread and the short parts. These two are uh, just machines. The uh, technology is different, but they give you similar res results. So what we do here, we apply a gentle pressure and with a bristle, right? And then they come in contact with the actual cervix and this play across the cervix. Then the instructions are given in there. I don't have to do it We have to rotate it in a clockwise manner and these all instructions will be there in your machine. And you can, if you can see, the only thing is that the brush is collecting the cells and then this brush will dipping into a solution. So all the cells are being captured and then it goes into the machine, which is the LBC machine. Right. Next, we come to a very important um, method which we have in diagnostic cancer and it is called histopathological examination. Now, as I told you, here what we do is we analyze the microscopic features of tumors and tissue samples can be obtained by a number of methods. They can be needle biopsy, and now we have also got a USD guided needle biopsy to, as I said, to have a representative sample. We will first see it under the ultrasound and then so that we actually go into the lesion and then biopsy it. There can be endoscopic biopsy, it can be an incision biopsy, or it can be an excision biopsy. And I also talk about something which is called the frozen section because this is something which sometimes. Uh, when we started phone session, uh, people feel the thought that it's something magical. It will give you reports in 20 minutes, but uh, I'll tell you, it is not all, uh, it's not a magic. Not every report can be given on frozen section. Is this a technique which helps you in some cases? Right. So these are the different uh, methods. Needle biopsy, all of us know that we are using a needle and then we take a pole biopsy. Then we have endoscopic biopsy. This is the incisional biopsy where we go through the tumor and take a bit from it. And the rest of the tumor is there only. 
and then we have an excision biopsy where we take out whole of the tumor tissue. So, as I said, the pathologist will examine these tissue samples under the microscope and they will, they will identify specific cellular and, very importantly, architecture. For us, the architecture is very important because it gives you many hints about the cancer. Sometimes you might be seeing very malignant looking cells in a breast, but the stroma may appear normal, right? So what happens is you have to have some stromal changes. Like we see something called desmoplasia. Desmoplasia means excessive fibrosis. So if there's desmoplasia present, along with this abnormal cells, it helps in, the, in you know confirming, yes, this definitely can be a case of a total carcinoma. So stromal changes, the architecture of the cells, the invasion, then looking at the lymphovascular invasion, there's so many uh, features which a pathologist looks at and then comes to a final diagnosis and each and every one of, it, one of them has got a value and these will help you in treating your patients. Like there's something called ductal carcinoma in situ. Along with our invasive ductal carcinoma, sometimes we get an extensive component of DCIS. Right? So why it is important to report DCIS? It has been found for two very important reasons. Number one, if you have extensive DCIS, then there are chances of recurrence of the tumor. And yes, you have to look for DCIS at the margins of the tumor. Right? If the DCIS is present at the margins of the tumor, again, there are chances that this tumor is going to recur. Also, the DCIS tells you a very important diagnosis. If you're seeing lots of DCIS, then definitely the tumor there, histological diagnosis is for invasive ductal carcinoma. It cannot be the other variants of carcinoma, like your lobular carcinoma or a metaplastic carcinoma or a sarcoma. So what I'm telling you, there are many, many nuances in diagnosing a cancer and they definitely are much better dealt with when we have a biopsy, when we have the architecture of the tumor compared to only cells. So as I've said to you, it gives you the accurate diagnosis. And here we have very fanciful terms. Uh, you must be aware, sometimes we uh, diagnose a tumor as a ductal carcinoma or press, sometimes we say it's a tubular carcinoma, sometimes we say it's a mucinous carcinoma. But hold on, it's not just that we are giving fanciful terms. The importance is that these tumors have got a different prognosis also. A tubular carcinoma has got a very good prognosis. And further explanation, I will tell you that if you are getting a diagnosis of tubular carcinoma, and you're doing next, you're doing ER, ER 30 meters, and you're getting ER negative, then there is something wrong. Because usually the tubular carcinoma, they're very well differentiated tumors, and they will definitely be ER positive. So if I'm getting a report of tubular carcinoma, and I'm getting an ER, ER negative in that case, which means the worst of your as a clinician, I would tell my pathologist, please, reading the ER, ER, there's something wrong with their, maybe your immunos haven't worked. Right. So those fanciful terms which we gave, they definitely tell you about the prognosis of the patient. Then, determining the tumor grade, I'll discuss about this later, the stage of the tumor and this. All these small, small points, like I talk about DCIS, I talk about the grade, all these help you in guiding treatment decisions. Because now the uh, treatment is not just uh, radiotherapy or chemotherapy, you know, blanket treatment is not now given. Now we have got, we have gone into the era of personalized medicine, we are going into the era of targeted therapy, where a precise report leads you to a precise treatment. And this, I think, will be covered later by my uh, uh, speaker, so I won't go into that part of it. But anyway, what I want to tell you is that all these features help you in making and guiding treatment decisions. So again, this question often arises. Uh, uh, very frequently, we uh, get queries from our uh, clinicians that you have grade but you have given stage of tumor day. So a very simple thing I want to uh, express here, that grade is what a pathologist does, and staging is what the pathologist, the radiologist, and the clinician does. Right. So that is that there's a difference between grade and stage of tumor. When we talk about the cancer grade, the cancer grade describes how abnormal the cancer cells look under the microscope when compared to healthy cells. And why this is important? We know, if we uh, go back to our chapter of neoplasia, we know that tumors, they usually develop from normal cells. So a well-differentiated tumors, which is a low-grade tumor, will definitely resemble the normal cells, whereas a high-grade tumor, means a grade 3 tumor, will definitely look very, very abnormal. So 
with lower the grade cancers, they are less aggressive and they have a better prognosis. Whereas the high grade tumor tend to be more aggressive. And when we talk about the grade, we have grade one, two, and three. This is what a pathologist does. Where we have grade one, these are well depreciated tumors and they are considered low grade. Whereas the grade three tumors are usually poorly differentiated. They have an aggressive course, and we know that their management is going to be much more aggressive compared to our grade one tumors. So the grading is what is the job of a pathologist. Now coming to what is the stage. The stage usually explains how large the primary tumor is and how far the cancer has spread in the patient's body. And we have got different staging system. We have the uh, TNM staging system. All the um, all the surgeons must be aware of this. And this TNM grading system is based, T is stands for tumor, N for load, and N for metastasis. And here, the primary tumor T, we have, depends mainly on the size of the tumor. Then N depends on the inflows involved or not involved. And then the distant metastasis is, then the distant metastasis tell you whether the tumor had metastasis to some other site. Right, so here the role of pathologist we give you the size of the tumor. We give you the T. We also give you the N. If the recent lymph nodes like the axilla has been uh, uh, sent to us, we tell you how many lymph nodes are there and how many are involved. And this requires further radiological as well as clinical assessment. So this is what we do in cases of breast tumor. We have got the modified blue Richardson grading system. And as I told you, it tells you how well a tumor is differentiated. So what do we look at? We look at tubule formation, means a normal breast has got glands. So the glands are in the form of a tubule, right? So if it is a well differentiated tumor, obviously the gland formation will be more than 75% or there's somewhere between 10 to 75%. If there is absolutely no, this is how glands look like. If there's uh, definitely no gland formation, a diffuse population of cell, this definitely tells you that the tubule formation score is going to be three points, which is a given going towards a high grade tumor. The next thing, very important thing, we look at the nuclear pleomorphism. And this is, let me tell you, the DNA of a cell is in the nucleus, and that is where the cancer develops. Because as we all know, it is the genetic mutations which cause cancer, and those genetic mutations occur in the nucleus. So this, the part of the cell which really tells you whether it is malignant or benign is the nucleus. So we as pathologists, we look at the nuclear features. How bad does the nucleus look? And if you see here, small uniform size nucleus almost looking like a normal cell. And here we see they are large, uh, bizarre looking nuclei. They have a brown nuclei. So we know that yes, it's a pleomorphism of the nuclear characters. And then what else we look at? And the other very important thing, mitotic figures and that to atypical mitosis. Mitosis, as we know, when a cell divides it, goes up into mitosis. So if it's an abnormal or a neoplastic cell, it is rapidly dividing. And these rapidly dividing metastatic or the neoplastic cells, they show atypical mitosis. So here we actually count the number of mitosis in the high power fields. And now we have a new, new uh, method of uh, counting this, uh, in uh, counting the mitotic uh, figures. We count it in per mm square, right? And then we decide how many mitosis we have seen. So what I just want to emphasize on you people is that this is how we go about grading a tumor. In the breast, we have the MDR grading system and these are the features which we then calculate and then we will give you grade three if the total score comes to about eight or nine and we can give you grade one if the total score comes to three, four or five. So we are scoring the abnormalities which we see on the microscopy and then we are grading the tumor and then we are reporting it to you and telling you how bad the tumor is so that it can be managed properly. Now, coming to another uh, important point is the frozen section. Frozen section, as we know, sometimes a quick diagnosis is desirable to determine the nature of a mass region, also to look at the regional lymph flow. This is very important when you're talking about a cancer, uh, a CA breast or any cancer, even thyroid, we get plenty of lymph nodes. Is the metastasis there? Because usually it is a, uh, I would say frozen sections are usually done next to the OT. And the patient is already opened up and you want to decide whether we have to go for a radical surgery or a, a conservative surgery. So we have to tell you immediately whether the lymph nodes are involved or the margins are involved or what is the nature of the tumor. But I would say it is a, 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 what we do here is we quickly freeze the tissue 
and then we cut sections out of it and then we state and we see the histology. But let me tell you, it is uh, something um, that we just compare it with a uh, maybe a instant food and a food which has been cooked over the time. We do see the characters, but they are very, not very clear. The final aspects, like I was telling about the different aspects. We, I was talking about your invasion. I was talking about the desmoplasia, the stromal characters. Those are not very clear in a frozen section. So sometimes we get a, um, like, a, like sometimes well, in our uh, college, it is very common, um, thyroid, you know. Then again, follicular uh, carcinoma, like I don't know how I'm getting too much into pathology, but in follicular carcinoma, what happens is a follicular carcinoma is a carcinoma only if you see capsular invasion. So very frequently we get a small tissue bed and we ask if um, uh, thyroid ka follicular carcinoma hai ya adenoma hai. So we say though the uh, frozen will not work here and fir wo jagra shuru hai, why it won't work here. Why? Because Frozen pay follicular carcinoma diagnosis nahi ho sakti hai. We have to see the whole capsule. Hamai paase wo pura tissue aata hai. We ink the whole capsule. A third part of the capsule me. We look for lymphovascular emboli. We look for capsular invasion. So there are limitations and many limitations of frozen section. But still I would say in experience compared to the fact it is a, it is very frequently, it is very accurate. And it does help a lot, especially in a, um, just next to the OT, when the patient is opened up, you want to know whether the lymph node is positive or not, or you want to know the margins are involved, and sometimes whether it is a tumor or not, right? Otherwise, I would uh, request and recommend all of you that if there is some problem with the um, frozen section, then you cannot get exotic diagnosis on the frozen section. It's better to wait for a few days, despite the drawbacks, than to perform inadequate or unnecessary surgery. Because as I said, frozen section has got limitations. And you have to agree that. Uh, just, uh, I said, I thought it's the rainy season. So uh, I think this is nostalgia, a rainy day holiday. Uh, I think uh, it does bear very bad to your feet. And in this rainy season, something would have really been smiles to all our faces. Right. I think I'll think. I think it's much more comfortable, and I hope we will be happy. Right. So now we come to another important thing: immunohistochemistry. And now I think when I came to Ahmedabad, I was talking about immunohistochemistry. There used to be a black woman in the area. But now the scientists are uh, recommending and getting out of this ice. So, this has come up a long way. So, let's talk about Antibody. We have to answer that. 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 We have to answ
and then we find the anti-antibody reaction following. So what happens is we have a secondary antibody. This will be a link that they can be so, other we ER So, here we have ER antigens. Uh, this gets attached to the antibodies against ER. Further, this will be amplified or other ground color proteins can be created ER positive. But let me tell you the next slide. So, this is inside your gum earlier. This is why the main reason now we need newer diagnostic models. Why? I mean, we are already here by the specific quality, but now we are in search and every day we are making a flow of new models. Right? So, you, what is the reason? So, let me start with this. They predict the tumor behavior, right? And what is proboscis? Proboscis mark a means that the natural history of or outcome of the tumor without help. So there are two terms which we want to talk about: prognostic marker and predictive marker. Prognostic marker is both of them. We have the patient who treatment many they are here. Then the prognosis will depend on that factor. Right? Predictive marker kya hota hai? Predictive marker tells you that what is the likelihood of the patient to respond to a intervention or a treatment. Now we have treatment here, and then what is the response of the patient to that treatment? That is the predictive. So we have proboscis marker. For example, if a tumor, a breast cancer, is let's say ER negative, then it will have worse overall survival than ER positive uh, tumors. So we know they need treatment, and we have therapy choices. We have a therapy tumor, so we go uh, and we complete therapy, and we get treatment. Right? Then we have another uh, thing. What happens is the predictive marker. So here what happens is, there is a predictive marker, it is showing ER expression. After this, what have you done? You are targeting this, this patient with hormone targeting therapies, and still next to see if the patient is not responding, what next we will do. So this is the difference between a prognostic marker and a predictive marker, and one of the reasons is, now we have got the, the new form of what is the other the new markers that comes up every day? It helps the robotic and the predictive uh, uh, response of the patient, and that will help us finally revive the tiger therapy of that patient. Now I come to uh, another part of the study. I will tell you a very simple study which was done, and which I'm going to uh, analyze here. That remember, we are talking about the ISC, but the most important thing for the ISC is. A pre analytical period, and that is in your hand. The surgery is focused on the ISC. Why the ISC can't be done if you haven't fixed it properly with other articles properly exposed? Then you go ahead. Other articles, let's say, open it to work is a huge mass, right? So properly cut a proper problem which is very frequently we uh in SRM we are getting samples in a polyethylene sunlight with other which is very common practice. And the patients are the kind of data has to work with them or give this to other time was issue like a matter of cellar current. So in this issue, if we go to the ISC counter, I doubt. Right? Why? Because I think the antigens and all the uh, uh, things have already gone off. Right. So the surgeons make a special request to you. We don't know about ISC, they are also doing that, but it's the first thing that you are coming in that you should be fixing tissue within six hours, and that we call the cold ischemia. Taking out the tissue to the body, and then the time it goes into a fixed stage. That is the time period called cold ischemia, and that is the ISC ISC was the gathering period. And then after breast tumor, yeah, ovarian tumor, yeah, endometrial carcinoma, what are they the Baha Dapa? None of the ISC are going to work for it, and you might. Get a report of a triple negative breast cancer, and you might do progressive therapy, and you might have been a ERPR positive tumor. So, here comes our role permanent fixation. What does this mean? Check. After the permanent, is this visit properly made? Have you made nicks in your tumor so that the permanent has to be eliminated inside, and then you have spent the pathology for further research? Okay, so remember the permanent fixation affects the the pre-treatment and antigen pre-treatment. So they become the pre-treatment antigen. 
आदि बड़ी विकास चल रही है अगर आदि के लिए रिटर्न नहीं हो पाया तो देयर बी नो एक्सपोनिक अटैचमेंट इन दिस बहुत नेगेटिव यस सो दिस अ व्हाट फॉर डस फॉर्मलिन क्या करता है ये एक केमिकल रिएक्शन से क्रॉसिंग प्रोटीन्स बनाता है एंड दैट लीड्स टू एंटीजन ट्रीटमेंट प्रॉपर्ली एंड फाइनली अगर हमने ओवर फिक्सेशन कर दिया है एंड देन वी विल सी दैट द स्टेनिंग स्टेनिंग इज अगेन नॉट ऑप्टिमल फॉर मेनी So this is a simple study I have you have for you. ये same breast tissue है, right? यहाँ पर क्या था? Fixation इसका fixation किया गया तीन घंटे के लिए, right? यहाँ पर इसका fixation किया गया छः घंटे के लिए, and here it was properly fixed for eight hours. And if you see the same tissue, ये cells जो मैंने आपको बताया था, when we are seeing the color brown dye, so these are clear positive breast cancer cells. So look at the results here. अगर फिक्सेशन इन प्रॉपर है लेस दिन थ्री आवर्स है, so you got a negative result. अगर आपका फिक्सेशन छह घंटे है, तो भी you getting a pretty positive result. तो low ER होने में, अब तो बीच में भी देखते हैं. Same breast cancer, in zero में will get a negative treatment. By simple sort of answers, the proper fixation was not there. And this study has been done with American Journal of Clinical Neurology published. We just did this. Three simple results. So I will give you one more again. Before the pathologist, it's your job to ensure that the specimen is being detected properly and is being fixed properly. Right. So I won't go into the details, but these are the present guidelines. We are we are positively in our hands. More than one person's other positive and we just we are positive. We see the previous case. Other one person's other positive is supposed to be a we are positive. Or other another patient that is there, but we just leave it at that. We are negative there. Guidelines to say what is one person's possibility is we are positive, and then we have different score. I won't go into details because that's basically our job. We have the orbit score and score. We are seeing that we are positive. We are seeing that. If 10% is down, we are positive. We are positive. We are positive. We are positive. And if it's more than 10%, then we call it a we are totally positive. Right. Now we come to another very interesting. ISC is definitely ISC higher to say yes we have been now and we have perceptive differences so this is a normal higher to receptor what is normal cell and this is a higher to false receptor so what do we see we have got excessive higher to receptor and again it is important because our higher to false fewer cell less cancer so they get a different treatment compared to our higher to negative treatments. Right. So this is again our guidelines. How we report her to? We have three categories. I see zero for her to. We have one class. We have three class, and we have three class. Three class is when there is a. When I go to the detail, I just show you pictures. This is what we do. What is important is a even open report होती है. Even open मतलब कि लाल भी लगे और कितनी positive. Then we further go for a confirmation by H or H, which is a molecular technique. Right. So this is what we see. It's like a chicken wire or a fish like kind of appearance, and this is three parts of the mastoidy. आपको एक cell की membrane में आपको ground mastoidy दिख रही है. So these are our this is our three plus or two, and this is when we do fish. आपने ये green signals दिख रहे हैं. This is what fish amplified function. So this confirmation of the mastoidy of negativity in unequivocal cases is done by fish amplification. Again, I will be reading it. This is how we determine whether it is fish amplified or not. We have different patients. Right. So, why it is important? Her, like we saw ERPR. Similarly, her to breast cancer treatment, and I think the surgery is very much detailed. But there's a few uh, interesting things. Like why do this model? Her to test. That's what great surgery for predicting this was told. Your last is not. Right. Now, last is not with or without. The mild chemotherapy in metastatic breast tumor it improves the response rate, time to progression, and survival. And last of all, it given a early breast cancer reduces the risk of recurrence and mortality. Also, chemotherapy has the possibility is associated with relative resistance to endocrine therapy, poor response to stable based therapy, and an enhanced benefit from anthracycline based and exe based therapy. So you have seen this one marker gives you so much information. To the oral surgeon as to how to further treat your patient. Okay, so this is a 
lovely picture again. So if you haven't seen this, you should be going on for the weekend. Uh, no, but we can, uh, Anabhan and Anam, we have uh, many of these uh, people from the ring. So there's something not to be missed this rainy season. Right. So we move on to another interesting test. We talk about flow cytometry. And what is flow cytometry and where does it work? Right. So flow cytometry, it analyzes individual cells. Now, you can see uh, what exactly is the difference between cell cultures. And when we are looking at the cells, here we are identifying the, again, the antigens and the antibodies in the cell. And in this technique, what we do, we processively label antibodies and we make them run to a flow cytometer. One cell at a time goes to a flow cytometer. And obviously, O can generate carriga, O produces in big carriga. So, this one is a big problem. And then we will again look at the data source. And let me tell you, it is very important to classify hematological malignancies like leukemia and lymphoma. Because as in our solid tumor, similarly, uh, I think we can talk about very well, it's going very well. That is, the liquid tumors have got so many supplies. We have so many diseases. Every day there's a new body classification. And as you see, excuse me. Yeah, what should they say? Right. Okay, now. I'll just finish off. I think uh, this uh, flu cytometry, just I think this is enough. It is used in classifying hematological malignancies like the DNA lymphomas. Right. Now, just the last part of my talk molecular techniques. And yes, we have to know what are molecular techniques. With the molecular techniques, we have PCR, we have FISH, we have NGS. Right. So, I won't go into the detail about what are these techniques, but FISH, we already have seen what are the uses of FISH in her book. Uh, Similarly, now we are going to uh, get an of NGS, next generation of proliferic. Here, what we do, we sequence large amounts of DNA and uh, RNA and we provide detailed information for the genetic mutations. This is something of the future. In the future, maybe we are not talking about the future. Maybe we will be having genes and we will be having drugs to target those genes. So, this is the future of homophobic Right. So, um, Again, molecular test, as I've already told you, we did not, uh, we, uh, we did not have it out of the past, we have seen that this is something in the future. Molecular tests are right here now, and they are being used in one universe. And uh, they are, uh, they definitely give us much more information than when the routine is so early. I think uh, something will be coming in detail, so I can skip this slide. And I think what I would like to say that they will help us select appropriate therapy for the patient. Right. And just an example, one of the tests currently they are using breast cancer for prediction and prognosis. A patient, once you treat the patient, the next question is whether the scoby or the scoby. Right. The patient wants to know that when did they have been asked for more. So that also helps. And we have these different methods. And then, in the, especially like uh, this is such what? Concordite DX. This is done in your positive patients, the uh, positive cases. It estimates that it's so reckless. And it also helps us select patients for adequate hemotherapy. It's just an example of how these are again, these are multiple genes which are being very complicated carefully, and they ultimately give you a let's say and a score. And they help you can tell that they tell you there is actually a risk of recurrence and what energy you typically require to the patient. So this I currently go through this because this is something very important. The tumor markers, I think every case in any patients, in any patients like uh, PSA does not have. I'm sure it is a case of prostate cancer, and surgeries are being done based on the levels of tumor markers. So, just uh, let's say we have a uh, few minutes to wrap up. This is something which needs to be covered because this is easily, few minutes needs to be covered. Okay, ma'am. Tumor markers is something which is easily available, and now we have so many, uh, 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 I would say, uh, private path tabs that they come with great promises. But uh, please, you have to do your test. Uh, great promises. Mean that we are the right uh, you know, the right information. You have to be informed. Tumor markers does help us in diagnosis and prediction. Diagnosis, for example, in these PSA levels, it may be present in prostatic cancer, but also in prostatic hyperplasia. Sometimes they can give you, they can be like a screening test, not a diagnostic test, right? Like CEA can be used for monitoring or for screening of progressive cancer. Sometimes they can give you prognosis. As I said, prognosis means. What the patients are having uh, next come by right, without therapy. So, in the uh, for a patient with prostate cancer, cancer, because yes, it is very hard. So, 
they indicate a more advanced or aggressive disease. They can also be used for monitoring treatment. Means uh, cancer levels if they are having significant decline, what is the therapy? Then they tell you that yes, the treatment can be correct, and they can be give you early detection of a relapse, right? But I think that and this is the classification. I think all of us know that there are uh, many uh, tumor markers. But then what I want to emphasize is that yes, just by exposed to the limitation. They are not specific, they are not sensitive, there is lot of individual variability. You and me, we might have a different uh own bodies, even in normal persons. So that means we can have a level two months overhead because this is a very common study here. See uh two months overhead, I mean cancer, but it is not that. Then it can be they can be lots of interference from non critic conditions. So why elevated levels of markers, transfers the presence of cancer, they are not definitely diagnostic tools and should be used along with other diagnostic methods, the clinical history and medical evaluation. Just wait based on tumor markers, please don't come to a definitive diagnosis. So that's the summary. Uh, clinical uh, reduction correlation is the first step in diagnosis. And yes, we have to use many tests now. We have to use ancillary tests to confirm a diagnosis. Molecular well, diagnosis is not essential as we are moving to the era of first-line medicine. But the most important is that we to still free and single, correct labeling, antiquate and representative sampling, and proper filtration. So these are the Western parts. Again, largely the right thing. I have technically I like to read techniques where they are going to be. Thank you. And sorry, the chairman, I just uh, told you the time. Here to raise a question as for the question of the host. Very nice presentation of the Thank you very much. I agrees. Uh, you very nicely mentioned the prognostic and the predictive markers. A lot of emphasis was in ER, PR, and HR. But in their very small, uh, small centers of reference to genetics, genetic origin of. Now, my question here is the role of testing for trichoma 2 g mutation. You didn't mention any about it. There was a time some 20 years back or something. Earlier days, I used to see that its role was emphasized as just a predictive. After if somebody has installed family history or um, you suspect something, so you just get this test then and decide whether this is likely to develop ovarian cancer, cancer or breast cancer. Then I saw the phase, the era when it was done even in the crude cases of breast cancer to Decide the prognosis and the treatment plan. Right? Okay, even the higher center, very good centers of remote uh, recruited Indian center were doing this. Now, recently I have seen that trend has again changed and they are not going for it. They are telling the patient that no, it's not required. So, I just want from you and also an opinion of the chair, and I feel very apologies like Sapan Srivastava and Dr. Kamal Singh is already there, Dr. P.K. Misha. So, I would just like to get enlightened about it. What is the correct way? Whether it, even if, if patient suppose has been operated for CFS, it still she should go for uh, this uh, black hour one in two tests. So that's a specific indication. Can I take the question mark? Uh, if it is indicated, then it is not indicated. That would be the correct one. So number one, uh, black hour, as we know, these are your DNA repair genes, and they tell you about identity based cancers. So if a young female comes to you and um, she's presenting with a malignancy, then definitely BRCA is indicated. Number one, genetic hereditary breast cancers have BRCA1 and BRCA2 mutations. Number two, BRCA, as we know the case of Angela Jolie, right? She was, uh, I, I think, uh, she went for prophylactic mastectomy and as well as uterectomy. Reason being, uh, her relatives were positive. Uh, but then part of someone was positive for uh, breast cancer. So it helps detect again whether you are susceptible for breast cancer in the future. Number three, now we are doing BRCA mutations. 
in most of the patients who are presenting at an early age, but because now we have a new therapy, I think Dr. will be covering it. We have PARP inhibitors for BRCA new mutations. Right, sir? So now you have to measure which test in which patient. Not every patient requires BRCA mutations. So we have to know which patients have to be have to go through BRCA therapy. And definitely younger age group or a triple negative breast cancer, that will be the thing of BRCA negative. Uh, question is suppose the technique has been done on one side, isn't it? You have done all the CRP separate and all that. But to decide whether she is likely to develop again on the other side, should it still a patient of CFS that the duty or say for the screening purpose should go for BRCA one or two or not? I don't think so, sir. In every case, we require, but I think our OCO surgeons and some of the audience can take this question better than one surgery thing. But the supplement or doctor supplement, he wants to comment. It's tough. Yeah. short of time, so I would uh, request uh, Kamal Singh, sir, Director Mohawk Hospital and President Allahabad Medical Association to kindly uh, honor Dr. Kashnar Verba, ma'am, with a souvenir. I now uh, invite the chairpersons, Dr. P. A. Singh, ma'am, Dr. Jyoti Nagarwal, ma'am, and Dr. Harsha Nagarwal, ma'am, to kindly come on the stage. <laughs> 